Hi there, welcome to Aspire for Autism. This is Autism 101, a short mini training for parents. And I hope that this just gives you a good overview of autism. This might be for you if you um, are questioning that your child might have autism. Maybe you're seeing some red flags. Um, this might help clarify some of that for you. Or you might be a parent who just received the diagnosis for your child and you're a little bit overwhelmed and you just wanna know what to do next and where to begin, where to focus. Um, this is for you as well. So let's go ahead and get right into it. So my name's Amanda and I'm a speech pathologist. I have 15 years of experience in the field um, in all areas of speech pathology, but I've really just grown to love working with autism, especially working with you parents and helping to support you. So that's why I put this together for you parents. Um, I have training, a lot of my trainings in DIR floor time, and that's really influenced my therapy and how I view disorders and um, diagnoses like autism. And it's because it's a developmental approach. So we're looking at children through a different lens developmentally, not, not necessarily through a checklist based on age or grade. And it's also a, an approach that has taught me to focus on helping to build relationships and to keep an eye on their individual differences. So this program, as well as my other trainings that you can find on the website, aspireforautism.com, have a lot of influence by DIR for time. I'm a, a mother of three, so I also have experience and I understand how busy you all are and how hard it is to give every single one of our kids our attention and our energy. So uh, that's a picture of my kids right there. I have a two-year-old, a 10-year-old, and an 11-year-old who's almost 12. And then I also had speech therapy as a child. So I have personal experience going through speech therapy while I was in school for various speech sounds. And I remember the impact it had on me and how much it helped improve my confidence and helped me make friends and things like that. So I can also relate to your experience <clears throat> um, that your kids are going through maybe with speech therapy and other services. So here's a quick overview of what we're gonna do today. We're gonna look at what is autism. We're gonna look at how it's diagnosed. And I'm gonna dispel some of the myths about autism and then give you some direction. Where do we go from here? So let's start with what is autism. So autism is defined as a developmental disability impacting social interactions and communication. And I got that definition off the Autism Society or website. If you look in the medical manual, the DSM, that's what a lot of, uh, that's what the medical professionals use to diagnose different disorders. You'll find the code 299 for autism. And they define it in that manual as persistent deficits in social communication and interaction across multiple contexts. Now, we'll go into a little bit more on the next slide, um, specifically the DSM definition and diagnosis. But let's talk about some causes. Autism is one of those disorders that has been around for a while, and there have been many theories about what causes it, and they, we still don't know, unfortunately. There still is not one specific cause Really, all the scientists and doctors can say at this point is that it's a combination of genetic and environmental factors that cause it. And so for every autistic diagnosis, it's a different, a different set of causes, a different set of characteristics. And that's why we call it a spectrum disorder, because a spectrum really tells how it is, is a range of symptoms, right? There are varying ranges of symptoms, varying, com varying combinations of symptoms and degrees. So every child is different, um, which makes it harder, right? And I understand that. The character, characteristics that you usually find on, on lists online and on checklists that are red flags for autism are usually obvious by age two. And it can be anywhere from age two to age six that, that these kids are getting diagnosed most of the time. <clears throat> now, Autism spectrum diagnosis, as well as Asperger's and PDD, NOS, and all these others listed here, um, all fall under this umbrella term, um, PDD. And that stands for pervasive development disorder. And so any of these disorders can fall under this term. So you might've heard things like PDD, NOS, and that's 
per pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. And so those are the kids that they're not quite sure if it's autism or Asperger's or Rett's and things like that. So they all kind of fall under this, under this umbrella term. So here is the definition or the diagnostic criteria straight from the DSM. I copied and pasted it in here for you. And there's a lot of words here. I'm not gonna go over this whole thing with you. I just wanted you to have this um, at your disposal, just so you know what doctors are using when they are diagnosing and what the code stands for. If you have this code on your child's reports or your insurance is already billing it, this is what it, this is what it entails. I highlighted the most important parts. I already read to you the um, definition up here. A child must have persistent deficits in um, each of the three areas of social communication and interaction. So according to the DSM, your child must have persistent deficits in each of those three areas below. And so the three areas below, you'll see them highlighted one, two, and three are deficits in social emotional reciprocity. And that really means or covers the back and forth type of communication. That's the take turn taking back and forth conversation. That's even back and forth sharing of interests and um, engaging with others. Number two is the deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviors used for social interaction. So those um, can be things like nonverbal communication, right? So these are like eye contact and body language and gestures and facial expressions. It's all of those things that come even before speech, even before verbal language um, appears. And so if you're seeing some deficits in that area, then those are red flags. And the third area is um, the deficits in developing, maintaining and understanding relationships. So this is really within social context. This is really where, you know, is your child playing with others, interested in others, making friends and things like that. So in those three areas, social emotional reciprocity, social uh, communicative behaviors and social interaction that are nonverbal, and then developing and maintaining relationships. It, if you look back up again, it must be persistent, persistent deficits in each of those three areas in order to qualify it as an autism diagnosis. I also highlighted above those three um, areas, persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction across multiple contexts. So I wanted to spend a quick moment on that phrase across multiple contexts. Now, this is where I feel a lot of diagnosticians or um, doctors who diagnose autism kind of lack in, in their, lack in their uh, evaluations. And that is because a lot of times, some of you might have already experienced this, your evaluation is very short in a small room and done by a checklist, 20 minutes maybe, and ta-da, you have an autism diagnosis. Um, in order to truly qualify as autism, it needs to be across multiple contexts. So if your diagnosis came that quickly and was not given to you after that person observed your child in multiple contexts, in different types of play, in different locations, at home, at school, in an office, across different experiences, um, that to me seems like it's not enough to diagnose autism. So that's just something to keep in mind. I would suggest multiple opinions and really researching your community to find the right doctors that are assessing this across multiple contexts and um, are really looking into it a little, spending a little more time with you. So that's just a side note. And again, that's just my opinion, but in my experience, a lot of the kids who have come to me for speech therapy have these diagnoses and that's been their experience. It's been a really short uh, evaluation process that doesn't really spend the time to look at how the child communication, communicates and interacts socially across multiple contexts. So how is it diagnosed? <clears throat> so a lot of times the progression starts with um, a pediatrician who is helping you keep an eye on your child's developmental milestones. So when your child goes in for his annual appointment every year, the doctor usually asks you a set of questions based on that age range um, for developmental 
um, checklist and to help you decide or help you see if there are things missing or behind on that checklist. So that's usually how it starts. That's usually where maybe a doctor or pediatrician might point out a couple areas that are becoming red flags. Um, and then it might progress over to some autism screenings. There are checklists that professionals can provide parents to fill out. There are some online and sometimes they're just a quick screening. Okay, you are showing some of these uh, red flags for autism. So there is a possibility for it. And then usually by that, at that point when there's enough of those concerns, the pediatrician will recommend that you go see somebody who can actually evaluate for autism. And the three people that I listed here are the most common ways to get evaluated. And one is by a developmental pediatrician. There's also a pediatric neurologist or a child and adolescent psychiatrist. So I have the definitions there of what each one of them is. And those are usually the most common um, doctors and professionals that parents will go to in order to get their child assessed for autism. Other evaluations that might come after that um, are speech and language evaluations, occupational therapy, behavioral, ABA, applied behavioral analysis um, evaluations, and early intervention and evaluation. So there might be an overall developmental evaluation that is recommended for you um, that covers <clears throat> all of these areas all at once. So there's also that. There's also um, assessments that might take place at the school district level if your child is over three. And that's that then becomes less of an early intervention assessment process and then it's handed over to the school districts at that point. So this is the usual progression. Some of you might have already kind of gone through these steps and understand that. Others of you who are just kind of looking online, seeing the red flags, curious about where to start, um, you might actually go and approach your doctor and ask for a referral to one of these um, professionals to evaluate a child. Or some families um, start with speech therapy. I get a lot of kids who come to me first before any diagnosis because their child is not talking. And so that's another route. So there's not really one straight route. And there's also, I'll get to this in a little bit, um, the question of if you wanna go straight for an autism diagnosis or if you want to start with speech or occupational therapy to kind of tease out some of the symptoms and the characteristics that you're seeing. And speech and occupational therapists are a great places to start in my opinion, because they can help guide you in seeing if there are those red flags and if it's worth going to um, a, a pediatric neurologist or psychiatrist to get evaluated. <clears throat> so before we move forward, I want to talk about some myths of autism. So if you've gotten the diagnosis or even if you haven't, you might have heard some of these myths and have been just frightened by some of them. And like I said, autism has been around for a while and there were some very um, sad myths out there that, that are finally being misproven. So the first one I have is that autism is a mental health disorder. Um, they have since proven now that that's not true. There is actual brain and abnormality and dysfunction um, that really separates it from a mental health disorder like depression or anxiety. Now, a lot of kids with autism or adults with autism might have coexisting mental health disorders like um, obsessive compulsive, ADHD, anxiety, all these other mental health disorders. Sometimes they go hand in hand. So it can be confusing when you're at the stage of trying to figure out um, what the actual diagnosis is. <clears throat> autism is um, caused by poor parenting. That's a horrible myth. There used to be something called the refrigerator mom. And basically moms were being blamed for their child having autism because of their poor parenting skills. They were not uh, connecting with their kids enough or playing correctly. So that's what brought on autism. Um, hopefully you know that's not true. And if there's any sense of you somehow causing this for your child, I just want to tell you that that is a complete myth. It is untrue. And like I said in some previous slides, it is genetically and environmentally um, caused and it is not your fault. It is, has nothing to do with your parenting. Autism is caused solely by environmental factors. So like I just said, it is not just environmental factors that cause autism. There is a link between genetics as well and other things going on. Autistic people lack empathy. 
we hear this a lot. I hear this a lot because I'll receive reports that have empathy listed as an area of weakness. Um, what is actually true is that autistic people really do have empathy and are sometimes more empathetic than, than neurotypical children. And it's the, the fact that they aren't maybe expressing it in the same way we do, that it comes off as if, as if they are not empathetic, but they really are. They really do feel for each other and are sensitive to each other's feelings. Autistic people lack humor. That is not true either. I've met plenty of kids and adults who have really great sense of humor, telling jokes, make me laugh all the time. So not true. And finally, all autistic people will end up in a facility. And this is maybe used to be true a lot of years ago, but now we're realizing that the brain has so much room for improvement and learning and that many, 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 if not most autistic people uh, end up growing up to have jobs and go to college and have relationships and have families of their own and live very happy lives. So if you're worried that your child is gonna end up in a facility, I wouldn't worry about that. The majority of them um, end up doing pretty well in life and there are so many resources and services out there to help them get there. So on that same note, I wanna help you focus on the strengths. I made this word cloud with a few words that really stand out to me as strengths for autism. And I listed a few here over here on the side, in tune with surroundings, a lot of our autistic kids are so in tune with the sights and sounds around them, which can come off as maybe hypersensitivity or getting overstimulated by sounds and lights and things like that. Or maybe you feel like it distracts them from interacting or engaging with people. Um, so it's often portrayed as a bad, a bad thing, a negative thing, but really they are so in tune with their surroundings and can just soak up the beauty in the world that we oftentimes are missing. So I see that as a strength. Um, they become experts in things. Again, people can say that they are obsessive about things or they're rigid and they just so focused on this one thing. Well, that's because a lot of autistic kids are experts. They like to, to learn something to mastery and become experts in that subject, whatever the subject is of their interest. And that's something that a lot of us can't say we can do. We get distracted. We focus on too many things and aren't experts in anything. Um, so it's a strength detail oriented, you might see your child really staring at the car's wheels and looking at the underside where the screws are and just really focusing on those details. That's a huge strength that can come in really handy later on for many jobs I can think of. Visual, a lot of autistic kids are visual learners. And um, in the therapy world, it's often taken as a negative thing or a crutch. And so there's like almost overly providing of picture cueing systems and things like that. But really a lot of kids, just because they're visual learners doesn't mean it's a weakness. It's actually a really great strength because they're tuning into the visual pictures and environment around them. Um, being empathetic, I had just mentioned in the last slide, they really are empathetic. Strong memories, uh, this is a big one. I've seen this in so many of my autistic clients amazing memories. A lot of times it's that visual memory. They can picture, remember what somebody was wearing or uh, remember what it felt like that day two years ago when this happened. Or um, they can remember the details of stories sometimes or, or um, videos or movies and they can re recite it by heart, some line in the movie. And so their memories are sometimes amazing, right? Huge strength. I talked a little bit about them being hyper-focused on things, That's, that can be a strength. There's a lot of creativity and artistic abilities I've seen and being active, they have so much energy, some of them. We might see that again as being overstimulated or not being able to calm, but we can, we can see that as a strength and use that toward helping them to focus it in another way. So I wanna help you parents focus on these strengths because some of you are in the process of getting evaluated and you're going to have reports that state all of the weak areas. And you're going to have reports that say what your child can't do. But I want you to hold on to these strengths, maybe print out this word cloud, put it up high, make your own that you know about your child and focus on those strengths because there are gonna be times where you're gonna to need to remind yourself of that in this process because it's gonna feel overwhelming and daunting that all these areas need to be worked on. But just try to remember there are tons of strengths there in that child, every child has an amazing plethora of strengths and creativity and wonderful skills and talents and, and um, just amazing qualities that make him or her unique and special. So try to hold on to that. 
I did also want to touch on behaviors briefly. And you might have seen this uh, visual in some of my other presentations. I have a whole separate uh, free course on behaviors. So if you are having some difficult behaviors that you're trying to figure out how to deal with, I have a whole nother course on that. So you can find that on the website. Um, and I wanted to touch on it today as well, because part of your child's diagnosis often um, has to do with behaviors. And a lot of the goals you're going to see in the reports and recommended by different professionals surround those behaviors. And um, what has been very, very common in the trajectory of what is recommended for autism, once you get the diagnosis, a lot of times you, the first place parents are um, led to go is to find behavioral support through ABA mostly, applied behavioral analysis types of therapy, and um, which is can be very helpful. But I want you to kind of look at behaviors to, with me today a little bit and just have this ready in the back of your mind while you're going through the process of evaluations and stuff because going straight to a behavioral therapist is not always the best first step for families. Um, and I can get into that again with your, your other uh, free course on behaviors and you can uh, watch that for more information on that whole idea. But I'll just go over this one slide with you. Some of the behaviors you're experiencing are, are very hard to deal with and it's really hard not to focus on those behaviors. And those are things like meltdowns and, and hitting and kicking, maybe refusal to work, um, getting in trouble at school and, and maybe even things like scripting where they're repeating lines from a movie over and over and it's just just sounds weird or isn't socially acceptable there are just these behaviors that are really hard to see past but if you look below the surface of those behaviors like this iceberg there's actually a lot more below the surface even bigger than that tip of the iceberg um, that i really want you to take a moment to focus on and those are the whys why are these behaviors happening and they can be caused by things like regulation issues, sensory integration deficits, cognitive delays, speech and language delays, social and emotional weaknesses, uh, developmental, all sorts of developmental weaknesses or motor skills, right? Or maybe their preferences are just not matching the activity or the challenge at that moment. There are many, many more. But I just want you to think about what's below the surface of those behaviors. If your child is hitting or kicking, is it a communication difficulty? Is there something that led up to that behavior uh, throughout the day or throughout the week that has a lot less to do with the actual behavior, but with something that's going on emotionally or regulation wise? So there's just a lot to look at here um, before we jump to trying to extinguish or fix the behavior. So just keep that kind of in the back of your mind. Okay, so you now know sort of what the process is like, who diagnoses autism, um, what some of the red flags are, what the diagnosis list as criteria. <clears throat> and so now you're asking, where do we go from here? So maybe you have the diagnosis and you just don't know where to begin, right? Um, the first question to ask if you haven't had the diagnosis yet is, do I want to get an autism diagnosis? Is that the first place I wanna go? If I'm seeing red flags of autism, it makes sense that you'll likely want to go straight to that, that neurologist or a psychiatrist to diagnose your child. Um, but there are other routes to get there, like I said. There are things that you might be seeing that fall under the speech and language category occupational therapy category and so many others. So you first wanna ask, do you wanna start with the diagnosis? And it's great if you do, or if you don't, you can go either direction. And then let's say you have the diagnosis or you don't, you just have the red flags. The next thing you're gonna look into are services. So I listed a few here. This is not all of them. These are the most common ones. There's speech and language therapy. That's myself, occupational therapy and behavioral interventions like ABA. There's even music therapy and hippotherapy, which is with horses. Um, and there's also play-based and developmental approaches like DI or floor time, which is what I'm trained in. There's another one called RDI, which is very similar. It stands for relational developmental intervention um, and play-based approaches. So there's lots of different therapists who are trained in different play-based approaches. So depending on your family, and your child, 
you might go um, focusing on any of these areas. Some families get all of the above all at once um, and just jump right into all the services. Others maybe want to start with speech and maybe OT and kind of see what, what's needed that comes out of that. And those professionals can help you <clears throat> kind of pinpoint what areas to focus on. And then the other thing on number three is you really want to get some parent education. And you started that today by watching this course. You're getting some education and there's a lot more for you. And you want to be empowered. You want to be able to be given tools um, for using at home. So you're not just relying on the professionals. And one way to do that is through our course, Care for Parents. You can get information on that on our website. And it's <clears throat> really a course for helping you um, really pinpoint what your child needs. It's going to help you focus on, on the strengths. It's going to help you look at your child's interests, sensory needs, um, how your child learns, how your child plays, what developmental level your child is at in all those areas. And it's going to help you then prioritize um, which services maybe are needed more quickly or all at once. And if you don't have a diagnosis yet, it may even help you decide if that's the route you want to go right away. So Care for Parent Parents is one of the few courses I know of that is focused on parents. And it's really there to help you um, understand your child. Because like I said, in the autism spectrum of diagnoses, every child is different. And there can be a multitude of different characteristics there. So you want to na nail those down so you know what approach to take and where to focus your energy. And then there's also parent support groups I highly recommend. You really do need to be in a community of other parents who are going through this process too. It is not like everything, everything your friends are experiencing, your family members are experiences, experiencing. This might be very new to your whole family and you really need to have that support. So we actually offer a um, parent support group that's live on Zoom. It's on Wednesdays right now. And if you're interested in joining our support group, you can email me. I'll share that email on the last slide. Um, and I can share with you our Zoom code and you're welcome to join. So there's also um, Facebook parent groups that you can join. We have one of those as well. And that's um, you know, a good place if you're not really into the live speaking about your situation kind of thing and you'd rather just type in comments and ask questions in that format, there's that as well. So very important to your child's progress, I can't say that enough, is your education, your empowerment, okay? You really need to spend some time thinking about where you can be more educated to understand your child more and um, your child's needs and how to get support for yourself as well. And then there's the medical side of things. A lot of kids with autism um, have food allergies or sensitivities, maybe sleep issues, dietary issues, digestive issues, um, tummy issues. There's, there's a lot of things medically that can be going on as well. And so you do want to get some of that checked out. You have some biomedical options. You've got vitamin supplements, special diets to try probiotics and alternative method, methods as well. And that could be a whole nother training in itself. So I am working on that for you guys. But for now, what I would suggest is within those parent support groups, like on Facebook and things like that, in those communities, you can reach out to those parents who have been through a lot of these medical and biomedical evaluations and diets and tried all these supplements and probiotics. And you can reach out to them and ask, you know, what doctor do you use? What, what pro, probiotics do you take? Um, do you have a doctor in this area that you recommend? And I think that's the best way to find the right doctor who's going to really help lead you along that journey of checking out if your child has some of those medical things that are are exacerbating those symptoms and those characteristics of autism. Okay, I know this is the question you're asking. How do I afford all these services? I listed a whole bunch of services there, right? And no money does not grow on a tree. So here are some other options that are actually um, funded for you. One of them is most states have an early intervention program. In California, it's the regional center. So each county has its own regional center that you would reach out to. And they provide um, and help cover services from zero to three. And then when your child is three, they usually recommend you um, go into an early childhood program. 
that's through some therapy clinics, some preschools, and also the school district sometimes has an early intervention or an early childhood program um, preschool at their, at their campuses or in their district. And so those are also covered usually. And then school district services are covered. Um, you can get an evaluation done there once their child is over three. And then that's when they recommend, especially if they're school aged, they recommend services like speech therapy, or occupational therapy, behavioral services um, on their campuses. And those are all going to be covered for you. Um, the other option now is met using your medical insurance. And those are usually used when you go to a private clinic or a private therapist who takes your insurance, who you're in network with. So you would call your medical insurance and you would ask um, for the specific evaluation you're looking into, like does my insurance cover speech therapy and how much and who's in network. And then you would find a local clinic or therapist who can provide your evaluation and those services that you're looking for. The other option is private pay. So this comes in handy when maybe your insurance doesn't cover autism or speech therapy or something like that very much. And, or maybe you have found a wonderful therapist that's not in network and you wanna use that therapist or that clinic. So private pay would be then you're paying cash. And a lot of these professionals will provide you with something called a super bill, which is really a statement that says you pay for these services. It has that diagnostic coding on it. And you would then submit it to your insurance and get reimbursed for a portion of what you paid for services. And so there's that option. There's also some grants out there. And if you're interested in trying to research and find grants that will cover some of your services, you can call this number here I've listed from the US Department of Health Services. So there's a lot of options out there that many people don't know of. A lot of families start with the early intervention programs if you've got a little one, a toddler. And um, a lot of pediatricians will recommend these services as, as well. So you have some options there. There are some families who can afford private pay for all of their different services and are able to get some of it reimbursed and that's what they prefer. If you need some help kind of figuring out what's best for your child, um, whether you should go through the early intervention process or school district or just find a private pay situation, if you need some help just kind of talking that through, you know, feel free to reach out to me. You can call me, email me. Um, and I can kind of help you figure that out for your family. Um, it's also the type of question you would post in our Facebook group to other families, um, especially within your community, if you join one of your community groups based on autism or even just community groups about um, special needs or speech therapy. Thank you so much for joining us and watching Autism 101. I hope it was helpful. Hopefully you got some information and give you some direction. We are here to answer questions. If you wanna reach out, go ahead and give us a call. The number is right down there, 949-391-9356. Or you can come to the website and get more information. If you scan the QR code, it has all of those ways to contact us and it'll send you right over to our Facebook parent page that you can join the group there. Um, you can come to the website or even watch more videos. So hopefully, again, this is helpful and I hope to hear from you soon.